Thank you so much, Hassan, for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to join this uh, webinar. <clears throat> yes, uh, you you, um, you mentioned about the book. I would like to introduce this book. Uh, this is uh, an open access book which has been published by Springer. I'm a, an author, actually, uh, in this book. And please share this link with everyone. This is a free uh, or open access book. And feel free to download and read the book. And please share the link, not the PDF file of the book, because I would like to get an idea about how many times this book gets downloaded, where it gets downloaded, and so on to making a statistics out of it. Because Springer will provide me with that uh, statistics. So feel free to uh, read the book. This is a book written uh, by me over five years and my colleague, Oliver Sosson. And uh, actually, industry has been behind it, academia has been behind it, and uh, this is uh, something which engineers and the students they can read and enjoy their time. So uh, in today's presentation, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about well integrity and plug and abandonment. There are two concepts which are tightly connected and we cannot separate them. That's the reason that I have them here. And then I will continue with uh, explaining why we will do, uh, we need to do PNA. It doesn't mean necessarily it's uh, depleted well to be PNA. Sometimes we have well, uh, actually, that they are forced to be PNA. To show the importance uh, and show the consequences of uh, PNA, a poor PNA operation, I'm going to review some facts, statistics, and showing some pictures as a consequence of a leak to environment. Then I will continue with rules and regulation, reviewing briefly what are current local rules in Norway, explaining what are the regulatory authorities in other countries and what are the similarities and so on. Then we'll continue with challenges for doing PNA operation and how we can turn those challenges to an opportunity or to opportunities. And then moving forward, Actually, we will talk about uh, barrier materials. We are familiar with cement, but there are other type of barrier materials which we will actually or we can use, or we can go and select and and use them. Then, when we select a barrier material, we need to talk about or explain how we are supposed to place them downhole. Actually, PNA means working downhole. And how you're going to place it, you need to present or, or, or having an idea about the placement techniques. When the barrier has been established, then you need to verify it, how you are going to verify your barrier, how you can ensure the regulatory authorities that you have established a competent barrier, rock to rock transformation, all the way to formation, cross sectional barrier. This is uh, the agenda for today with two barrier philosophy, which actually we are familiar with. Okay. This is the reservoir and the cap rock on top, overburden above the cap rock. Okay. <clears throat> the function of the cap rock is to hold the uh, pressure in a controlled manner. Okay. We see natural steeps, which means that the cap rock fails and then the oil of hydrocarbon can find its way all the way to the surface. During the drilling, actually, bit penetrates the cap rock and we remove that barrier. So we need to actually uh, control the pressure, the source of flow, and have it under control to produce. That's the reason that we have the primary barrier as shown by blue. Human being is conservative. Sometimes actually plan A doesn't work. You should go with plan B. You should engage plan B, okay? And that's the reason that we go with second barrier, which has been shown as red. We call it secondary barrier, okay? And this is a backup. It's not supposed to be engaged, okay, unless the primary barrier fails. The interesting part between the primary and secondary barrier is that the primary barrier is supposed to start from the cap rock, okay, to the casing cement, casing, and all the way to cap rock. The same argument is valid also for secondary. This starts from a rock, competent rock, all the way up and back to the rock. The only difference here is that you are using cap rock as the primary element. Here you are using another competent formation. Okay. And actually, uh, this primary and secondary barrier philosophy um, has been or has been with us since we started to construct the world. However, the type of well barrier element 
differs or changes over time. As an example, when you do drilling, okay, we use drilling fluid to hold the pressure back. This is our primary element. And then as you can see, we have formation, casing cement, casing all the way to wellhead POP, back to formation at secondary. Why I'm using or we are using fluid? Actually, because we have BOP in place. If BOP is not in place, fluid is not accepted as a part of your barrier element, okay? As a part of your barrier envelope. So <clears throat> we have two terms that we need to pay attention. Well barrier envelope, well barrier element. An element by itself is not capable to hold the pressure for you. But in combination with other well barrier envelope elements, they can hold, create a barrier and hold the pressure for us. Okay. The same again is valid for during the life cycle of a well from construction to PNA and post well abandonment. Okay. The two definitions for well integrity ISO 1653-1, North Stoke D010. Both of them, they are talking about controlling the pressure. Okay having the fluid under your control and produce it in a controlled manner. The only difference between well abandonment or major, major difference between well abandonment and other types of activities which we have, I mean, drilling, production, damage, is that you are not interested to re-enter the well, okay? Because <clears throat> we cut and remove the wellhead in the end, and actually we cannot get back to the well bore. Because there is no wellhead, you can't install your POP. Moving forward, <coughs> focusing a little bit more on uh, permanent abandonment, as you can see, we have a blue color shown as the primary red color. Actually, this is our secondary. And there is an environmental plug above. I don't call it environment. I call it plug. In my book, I mentioned actually, I, or I called it as environmental barrier. However, over time, actually, I reached the point that this is not a barrier, this is a plug, because industry reached also to the same decision or conclusion. I will explain it a little more to, to clarify, because that's important for us to understand what is a barrier and what is a plug. In this case, we have cement inside liner. This is a cement plug. But our primary envelope starts from cap rock all the way back to cap rock, which we call it as cross-sectional barrier, or North Sook also calls, calls it as um, cross-sectional barrier, okay? But when you go to, set to <clears throat> environmental plug, formation close to surface is not competent to hold the pressure if a leak happens, if primary and secondary they fail. Your plug inside casing, surface casing, of course, it might be able to hold the pressure for you if it has been qualified and verified. But it doesn't mean necessarily the leak is going to go through or meet only the plug. It can go through the annulus to the formation and expose itself to formation and then fracturing the formation and coming to start leaking to surface. That's the reason that I call it as an environmental plug at envelope. But why we use it? Because of different re reasons. There are the drilling fluids in the annulus, which they can, if you calculate the volumes, you will find out that huge amount of, per well actually, huge amount of the drilling fluid, which they can be exposed to see. There can be cross flow between these annuli and actually see water can penetrate formations. It doesn't mean necessarily we're going to get a leak to environment, but also from environment surrounding it as well. That's the reason that we establish an environmental plug. Moving forward, um, I would like to talk a little bit about PNA phases. We define four different operational phases, okay, to complete a PNA operation. We call them as phase zero or well intervention activities, phase one. Reservoir abandonment, phase two, intermediate abandonment, phase three, conduct wet head and conductor cut and removal. Some companies 
still they do not recognize phase zero. However, this is the key to success, to recognize it and implement it properly. What we do in phase zero? <clears throat> to add to that, what we're gonna do in phase zero, we need to understand why we are going to flag and abandon our world. A well can be depleted, or, okay? Or suffering from well integrity issues so that we cannot do a um, remediation. Then we need to do permanent DNA. But it doesn't mean necessarily we need just to, to do depleted wells to plug and abandon them. Sometimes we have incidents like a cargo is moving, hitting a platform, then you're forced to do PNA and establish a new, uh, let's say, or build up a new uh, fixed platform. If it's a subsea wall, uh, kind of submarine, or a boat can actually uh, hit the Christmas tree and kill the chance. So this is not only depletion, it's forced PNA as well. If it's a depleted well, then you're talking about, or we need to distinguish, is it an injector, producer, gas producer, oil producer, water injector, or cutting reinjection well? Okay. Usually when you're talking about gas, gas has high flow rate, it carries sand sometimes, and then the production tubing, if there is any, will be corroded. If it's a production casing exposed to sand, then it will be eroded. If you produce oil, then there are downhole chemicals which they will damage the production tubing and creating challenges for us. In phase zero, in fact, we do data gathering. We don't engage a reef. We engage a wireline unit or a coil tubing unit to investigate the condition of the world because most of the time, these wells, they have been left for many years, up to 50 years. And we have no idea what's the condition of the world. Okay. Even we don't dare to open, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the well because we, we need, we would like to re-enter the well. There is a plug inside the tubing hanger, but we don't know if there is any pressure underneath. If you go and search on the net, you will find lots of incidents actually because we didn't have any idea what's underneath of my secondary barrier. So <clears throat> we can run a caliper log. We can actually uh, check the quality of the production tubing. We can circulate the wellbore fluid. We can bullhead cement. We can do lots of activities in phase zero, which we do not engage rig means that the job is more cost effective. When you have this data, you go back to your PNA plan, okay, and you revise it based on the new information that you have. Then you go with phase one, you engage a rig if it's necessary, and you will cut, establish your primary and secondary temporary barriers. Then you will actually nipple down your Christmas tree, nipple up the BOP, okay, and starting your PNA operation in phase one. Moving forward, okay, <clears throat> what can force me to bring a rig is the annular barrier. Most of the wells that they create that they create challenge for PNA are old wells which we don't have any information about the casing cement. Either we lost the document or we actually did not lock them. What causes more problem is that an operating company got the licensee to drill a well, they constructed the well, they documented all of these um, type of cement, quality of cement and so on. The company was merged with another company, then the data got lost or they didn't include them in their archive and you don't have access to the data. In order to qualify your casing cement, you need to retrieve your production tubing to be able to run a lock CBL video. And that's the matter, it's a display that costs actually, or rig comes and the cost goes high and the risk could increase. If you document them, if you construct our worlds properly and document them, and then phase one will be significant the operations, activities in phase one, will be, uh, activities will be reduced. 
when you did uh, abandonment of your main reservoir by establishing primary and secondary barrier, then you go to phase two, which means that intermediate abandonment. In this case, you're supposed to identify all the sources of pressure above the secondary barrier. Find them, do a um, risk evaluation to find out if they, they are a source of flow. If yes, are they water bearing zones or hydrocarbon zones? And then you move forward to establish primary and secondary values for them. That's phase two. Then in the end, when you seal off all the potentials, I mean, flow potential zones, you go to the last stage, which is cut and removal of the wellhead when you establish your environmental flight. That is the most problem, uh, I think a challenging part, because when you cut it, if a leakage happens, you cannot re-enter the well because you, there is no wellhead to place the BOP on and re-enter the well. Okay. Remember, the concept and the activities on uh, doing well abandonment doesn't make any difference if you are on land or offshore, because this is subsurface activity. The cost will vary, of course. The working units that you need to engage will vary. But the main content, the activities, the tools that you're using, more or less are the same. Okay. What has been happening and what you have been asked to do? Assume or imagine this is your reservoir and this is a calf rock above. What we did, we uh, penetrated the calf rock by a bit and then it started to produce. What we need to do, or what we are supposed to do, just to restore the cap rock. So put it that way. Plug and abandonment means that to restore the cap rock properly or its functionality, which means that find another competent formation, establish a cross-sectional barrier, you're safe. And you did your job. That seems to be an easy task. And PNA means that deconstructing a well. In other words, whatever you have done to construct your well, do it reverse. And this is the concept of PNA. Restore the cap rock or its functionality. So why it's important for us to focus on well abandonment? Because we need to see what will be the consequence of a leak. Here you see some examples what can a poor PNA operation or well control operation or well integrity issue create a challenge for you. Let's just start with this example. Okay. This is a, a gas reservoir in the Middle East where a Chinese company drilled an exploration well. Remember, most of exploration wells, majority of them, they will be permanently plugged and abandoned, abandoned after discovery, or even if it's a dry one, because of uncertainties for placing the casing shoe, cementing, and so on. The well is not competent to be used or, or, or reused as a production well or an injection well. Okay, they did abandonment, permanent abandonment after exploration. They cut and removed the wellhead. And the well started to leak, but not only from the wellbore, but through the channels far away from the main wellbore. Since they could not re uh, re-enter the well, what they did, they put the area on fire because methane is 26 times more dangerous. Some people say four, 24 times, some people say 20, scientists they say 26 times, more dangerous than CO2. So it's better to turn it to CO2, they put it on fire. Another example in Nigeria, another example in the US, another example in UK, US, or Canada, and US. You will see what could be consequence of poor well integrity practices or a failure in PNA operation or, or well integrity design. That's what can happen. And this is what we see. Sometimes there is a gas leak, which we can't even see it. It's offshore, even it's remote, you can't see it. Moving forward, <clears throat> let me to, uh, give you an overview. What, how big is 
plug-and abandoned. Okay? Since the first discovery in the Norwegian sector of the North Sea in 1966 or 1967 until June 2015, there has been derailed more than 5,500 wells in total, including exploration wells. Of these, 4,000 wells actually are production injection or uh, injector or monitoring wells, 1,500 exploration wells. And we assume that all of these exploration wells, which is a good uh, assumption, a valid assumption, have been permanently plug and abandoned. By that time, we had 460 wells in a temporary abandoned status. And 1,400 out of 4,000, they have been permanently abandoned. If you go back and do a calculation from 1966 to 1967 to 2015, you will see that as an average in the Norwegian sector of the North Sea, we derailed around 113 wells per year. It's a lot. And we are supposed to do abandon on them. Question is that are we going to use the same time, the duration per well to do abandonment as we did for well construction? Not necessarily sometimes there are challenges that they force you to use more time now just a simple calculation how much does it going to cost per well to do pna if you're supposed to do section milling as i said pna is a challenge but it can be a good opportunity to make a business out of it or do research <clears throat> here you will see uh, a map of uh, countries uh, countries that they are producing hydrocarbon. As you can see, you have Australia, you go to uh, Middle East, you go to Europe, and Canada up to Brazil. If you have uh, oil uh, producing country or hydrocarbon producing country, then there should be a kind of authority to do survey on your activity, either it's well construction or it's PNA. For example, in Norway, we have NPD, and NPD has a subsection which is called PSA Petroleum Safety Authority, which they do actually survey on PNA operation. What happens? An operating company says that I have a well which I would like to do permanent PNA. They write a kind of plan, submit it to PSA, PSA reviews, and checks with the current practices. And they will see if uh, that makes sense to do PNA, but they do not accept or reject because the responsibility is supposed to be with the operating company. And interestingly, they don't have many regulations in this case. They have only two um, main, let's say, regulations or texts about how we do our PNA. And if I want to translate them in my own words, it means, or they say that, give the back, give the well back to me the same way, the same way as I gave it to you, which means that to restore the cap rock and, and uh, give it back to me. So uh, I would like to focus a little bit on these regu rules and regulations because this is the most controversial part when you are a researcher or you're working for an operating company because let's say that you are in the US and you're using local regulations, you are used to it, and then you get a job, you're supposed to be relocated to Norway. So what you need to know, first of all, to find out what are the rules, what are the recommended practices in Norway. Not, it doesn't mean necessarily you will be able or you should go and apply your knowledge to Norway or UK or Australia, because every country, has their own rules and regulations. You should be prepared for that. Another case, you need to know what are your neighboring countries, what kind of rules and regulations do they have? As an example, if I have an oil well, let's say in Norway, and there is an oil well offshore UK as well, if those wells, they leak, the leak is going to go towards the Norwegian sector or to the UK sector. It could be the Norwegian well or the British well. Okay. 
So uh, people, they will see the consequence of that, regardless where they are living. Another example, interestingly, if a gas well leaks in the Middle East, it's going to take only two weeks for us in Europe to inhale the gas. We did not create that gas. It's not our well bore which is leaking. It's actually their wells. But we're going to experience that, which means that this is an international, let's say, concern. It's not only one country should be involved, a different country. They need to reach agreement about what are the best practices. But it doesn't mean necessarily we will land on or reach on to just one recommended practice or regulation, because everybody is unique. So be careful <clears throat> before you start a job, check the rules and regulation where you are, and then you start to design your PNA or conduct your PNA operation. And then I have another actually argument for researchers, for decision makers, for uh, so uh, people that they are involved in doing PNA is that if you have two countries with two different regulations, they are asking for two different lengths of barrier. I mean, that's not fair. A country uh, puts more money into the well board to do a better PNA or safer PNA operation, and the other country put less money and then inject that money to their society. So we need to do it properly to uh, preserve the environment on our uh, planet Earth. Okay, <clears throat> different regulatory authorities have their own requirements for PNA. Uh, who does regulate on the Norwegian sector? Actually, it's PSA. So uh, <clears throat> if you're not familiar with the, the regulatory authorities in your country, I highly recommend that you Google it, find out, and also review the current rules and regulations if they are available. In, if you are working in, North sea, in the North Sea and the Norwegian sector, actually you have only two rules, as you can see here. Uh, PSA has section 48 and section 88 that they are talking about well barriers and how we need to secure our world. And if you read them, they are just maybe two or three paragraphs each, not more than that, which means that there is no defined regulation because authorities, they don't want to take the responsibility. But they support the industry, and industry created a kind of recommended practice. This recommended practice is called as Northstock DO10, actually, for well integrity and PNA, and it has been developed developed by operating experts in the operating company, service companies, of giving input and try, they try to share their knowledge so that people, they will actually, <clears throat> for engineers, they do their PNA much more safer. I know that other countries like UK, they have their own oil and gas UK guidelines. In the US, every state, they have their own uh, guidelines. I know that in Brazil, uh, A&P, try to draft a kind of uh, recommended practices by uh, reviewing North Soak oil and gas UK guideline and putting their own internal rules and then like, creating a kind of recommended practice. And um, this is what is available for you. Moving forward towards the challenges, why PNA is so challenging, why it makes lots of problems for us. Actually, <clears throat> as an example, in the North Sea, if you check uh, ECOFIS, during production, the uh, the field subsided approximately eight meters, which means that when formation subsided or reservoir subsided, uh, the casing and casing cement actually um, <laughs> they gonna experience different movement, and then there will be a debonding between cement and formation. At the same time, remember, a part of a well is a vertical. Nowadays, we drill actually horizontal wells or deviated wells. When a formation subsides, there, there will be a collapse situation which will be limited access to the well bore. An operating company in the North Sea, actually, they did a section milling up to 60 days, I believe, to just mill down or mill away production tubing from top all the way to reservoir. Talking about section milling, those people that they have the experience, they know what is worth parts of metal, how they should be chewed away, milled away, transported all the way by using drilling fluid to surface, taking care of it, 
and what's the risk associated to handle the waste and also exposing your formation, depleted formation to a heavy delinquent. And I'm talking about ECD. Okay. Another challenge is lack of qualified annual value. We don't know what is the quality of cement behind the production casing when actually we have a production tubing. To check that, we need to retrieve the production tubing and that means cost, risk, and so on. Lack of documentation, as I said. Old wells. We didn't have time to scan those documents which they were drafted. <clears throat> we don't have them, we didn't scan them. If they were, we don't know even where they are. Company got merged, merged, even company got bankrupted. Restricted access to well water, as I said, because of the collapse. Corrosion, production tubing corroded, casing production tubing eroded, shallow gas pockets. 50 years ago, 40 years ago, we drilled wells. We couldn't identify shallow gas pockets or there were well integrity issues. Gas leaked to upper layers. Now there is a gas above your reservoir. You need to identify them. You need to actually seal them. But how are you going to identify them? Because they are behind the second casing stream and third casing stream. Another challenge. Source of flow, uh, flow in the overburden. This is not a leak, but this is a fluid which was there it doesn't have a flow potential or the flow potential is limited, but now you can detect them. And regulators, they ask you to take care of it. And section milling. Section milling is another challenge which we are facing with. We're supposed to mill away 958 inch casing as an example, which is L80, 80 pounds per foot. Calculate the weight of metal per, per foot that you're supposed to take up the weight. How long is it gonna take? These are some challenges that industry has been faced, have been faced in the past and today. And there are some challenges for the future. For example, smart wells. Now we will construct a smart wells. We don't want to have people offshore. We would like to have unmanned platforms tied back subsea walls. How are we going to take care of those smart wells, which they have control lines, cables, umbilicals, and every of these, they need to be retrieved when we're going to establish a cross-sectional barrier from rock to rock. These are actually challenges ahead of us in the future. At the same time, remember, when we are constructing the walls, we have lessons learned from doing PNA uh, of walls, so we can implement those learned lessons in our uh, <coughs> during our world construction and to to make the PNA in the future more easier. Talking about material, there are different types of barrier materials. If you refer to oil and gas UK guidelines, you will see that uh, oil and gas UK guidelines uh, um, categorizes different barrier materials to actually 10 different groups, including cement, which is cementitious material, uh, in situ formation, non setting uh, particles, all the way to glass and gel. Let me to give you some examples. <clears throat> the most interesting part, perhaps, is in situ formation. What happened? In the North Sea, a Norwegian operating, operating company, they constructed a wall, they logged the cement, their cement, and they identified type of cement. They start to produce from the well after well completion. After some years, because of well integrity issues, they retrieved the production tubing, and they logged the cement. What they found? Top of cement moved upward. How is it possible? My top of cement was at a specific depth, but now when I'm logging, I see the top of cement is in another place. They did testing, logging, and they found out that some formations, they have the possibility or capability to flow, to move, to creep, and create a seal for you. Actually, for me, as a researcher, is the best barrier because no one can challenge me. Cap rock is a formation. And remember what I said, the most of PNA cost comes because we don't have annual barrier or we don't have a verified, qualified annual barrier. We need to do section, we need to get access to formation. But now, Mother Nature created that barrier for you. But it doesn't mean all the world, all the formations they're gonna create, there are some special formations like shales, but they're going to creep if they are under certain conditions. 
uh, oil companies actually they start to do GAIP joint industrial projects to see how they can activate how they can activate the formation to move and create a seal because this one is going to help you during production of the well but also during PNA. Um, the second one is non-setting materials, which means that you have different particle, sand particles engineered so that the permeability is a minimum, and then there is a carrier fluid which will transport this one. You can pump it um, to the right depth, but they don't set at all. That's the reason that we call them non-setting materials uh, or grass. These non-setting materials, actually they deform, which is good, but the problem is that if they don't set, they need to have a foundation to rest on and they need to be locked on top because if the source, the source of pressure comes underneath and exceeds the hydrostatic pressure, then actually this barrier can be attacked or displaced. Moving forward, thermosetting resins, people, they are using thermosetting resins in some countries, some other countries, they do not accept organic polymers as a barrier. You need to understand the chemistry behind it, the long-term durability. Remember, you're supposed to do plug and abandonment for eternity. You're not supposed to get back to the well board. Okay. Moving uh, further on, there is a kind of modified in situ material. Actually, we call them a termite. As an example, termite, what we do, we create a, term, um, a reaction you know that the thermite reaction doesn't need oxygen it actually the reaction produces only oxygen what people they do or companies they do they melt down the whole casing control lines let's say all the way up to formation and then up and cooling the material case value every material that i reviewed from let's say cement to shale creeping shale all the way they have their own pros and cons which is beyond this, uh, the scope of this uh, or object of this presentation. The last but not the least we are talking about now is about bismuth. Bismuth is, a, an, is an alloy which can be melted by using thermite and open cooling, it expands. It doesn't create any chemical bonding with casing, actually, or, or, uh, but because of expansion, it creates a kind of mechanical friction. We put, it, put them inside, uh, inside casing. So, why we use metal like alloys? Because um, it doesn't mean necessarily we need to use steam at the 30 meter. Maybe we can use bismuth or other types of barriers with, let's say, one meter length. Then you go down with the length of your barrier with one from 30 meter, 50 meter to one meter. But again, we, we need to find out what are the pros and cons, what's the long term durability, what's the interaction between bismuth and casing steel and so on. And remember, some of these materials, you can't place them in an open hole like this one. Okay. Barrier placement. All of those barrier materials that I was talking about, they need to be placed down hole. Okay. If it's cement, we know how to pump cement. We have good experience with it. If it's shale, now we are learning how to activate it or if it's a natural effect. But what about bismuth? But what about thermite? We need to identify what are the barrier placement techniques. For cement, we are familiar familiar with two plug method. In Canada, that's popular to use a dump baler. In Australia, I believe it's the same. Here, the limitation is that there is no displacement. Uh, the displacement is just based on gravity, so we don't know if you get a clear or good actually a contact uh, or displacement effect. Then <clears throat> the, the barrier can be placed inside casing on a mechanical foundation or in, in a casing above a gel peel. It could be uh, placed across an open hole and so on. Remember, when you establish such a kind of barrier, this mechanical barrier, it's not a part of your permanent barrier because casing or metal by itself, it's not accepted. Uh, it's not approved as a barrier because it can be um, degraded and we have this experience with casing. But <clears throat> open hole, case hole, clear. But what about if there is a case hole with lack of, which is lacking of annual barrier? There are different techniques. You can do section milling, and section milling could be downward milling, upward milling. 
there could be cut and pull operation, or it could be perf wash technique or PWC. Perf wash cement means that you perforate the casing, you wash behind the casing effectively, and then you pump cement. And you establish your rock to rock barrier by this method, actually, you leave around 95 to 98% of your casing behind. Okay. Uh, it has its own concerns regarding actually how to run the uh, PCD guns and so on. Each technique has its pros and cons, and you need to understand it and uh, investigate it properly and adjust it in your documentation. Moving to the last slide, actually barrier verification. When you establish your barrier, regardless if it's inside casing, in, across an open hole, or as a PVC technique, you need to verify it. If it's a casing or annual barrier, you can log it. You have CBL, VDL, you have SPT, and so on. But what if it's in an open hole or actually it's a plug inside casing? There, you need to do weight testing. You can dress off your seam and do weight testing, and then you can do pressure testing, negative pressure testing, which means that you drop the pressure above your barrier to monitor the pressure buildup, or you can actually have a positive pressure testing, which means that you increase the pressure in your well bore, and then you monitor the pressure drop. However, with positive pressure testing, you are faced with ballooning effect of your casing or leak through the casing connection, which we don't have good control on. Using coil tubing, you will be challenged because coil tubing is not effective with weight testing or wild line items. Okay. So, uh, as I said, uh, logging a cement behind the second casing string is a challenge. Remember, cap rock is usually below the uh, casing shoe of the production casing. And the best place for you to place uh, establish your uh, barrier is close to the cap rock or across cap rock. But when you have liner, it's difficult to lock the cement behind the second casing string. Some operating companies, they came to this idea. Do hydraulic testing, perforate your actually <coughs> casing, and then do a communication test. In this case, what you do, you give a kind of a stress to your casing, to your cement, and the casing of cement can be damaged. Nowadays, I know that my colleagues in research centers here in Norway, they are uh, developing, or they have already developed in collaboration with service companies, logging tools, which they can see behind the second casing string and uh, they can log. But the problem is the reliability on the tools because they are new. And it's not us which we need to reach that point to, to use them, but also regulatory authorities that they need to get this confidence that, okay, yes, this barrier behind the second casing string is actually approved based on the new technique. This is an overview of actually what is PNA and what should be a PNA uh, talk about or actually what we need to consider. I'm going to open this uh, session for Q&A and um, I know that Hassan is going to read the questions and I'll try to address the question in a way that uh, you will uh, get to the answer. Yes, great. Thank you very much, uh, Mahmoud, for the nice and very interesting presentation. As you can see, Dr. Khalifa will uh, offer this uh, course, Plug and Abandonment of the Wells, in two slot times, 9 until 11 of March, and also 10 to 12 of August 2021. And also the main learning objective is the philosophy of PNA, concerns and opportunities, barrier placement techniques, verification and qualification of the barriers. Please remember that uh, we will offer 20% discount for PhD students group and also early bird registration four weeks uh, before. 